Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Brahm Center's health webinar. Today, we are very pleased to have Dr. Ko to give this talk about gout. And uh, Dr. Ko is a humorologist at the Antok Singh Hospital. And we have people streaming in right now. And uh, it's time to start. So Dr. Ko, would you like to start your presentation? Thank you. Um, I hope you all can hear me. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me your attention this, um, this, uh, this Saturday afternoon. Um, this is a novel experience for me because um, I'm here sitting down talking to um, my computer screen uh, when I'm more used to uh, facing an audience of people in Brown Centre. But let's see what uh, we can make of this. So this afternoon, um, Angie has asked me to speak on gout. And uh, the title of my talk is Gout, Separating Facts from Fake News. Um, gout is a very, very common problem, and I hope that um, in uh, our session today, uh, I want to cover uh, what is gout, and what has uric acid got to do with it, uh, who gets it, what treatment is available, and what I can do to help myself. So, um, I presume from the 57 participants uh, of this Zoom meeting that uh, many of you may uh, have gout or know somebody who has gout. Um, and it is actually a really uh, major problem. It's worldwide. It affects 1% to 2% of the population in the developed world. Um, and many more males are affected than females. So 4% of Singaporean males above the age of 45 uh, um, are affected with gout. Um, but this is rare. Gout is a problem that is rare in women before the menopause. So in a, in a woman who is still having periods, if she develops joint pains, um, it is unlikely to be gout unless that person has some other underlying health problem. So uh, women, bear this in mind. If you are still having periods and you're developing joint pains, um, it is not likely that the problem is gout. It is likely that the problem may be some other form of arthritis um, that would need you to go and seek uh, help. Um, and the variation in the number of people that get gout uh, um, in different parts of the world uh, may vary according to lifestyle. It may vary according to genetic factors. But overall, um, the numbers are steadily increasing. So if you have a look at this picture here, it uh, depicts what the ancient... Uh, um, uh, um, uh, the Europeans uh, felt uh, was the disease of kings. So um, the typical uh, um, gouty patient was one who uh, had wine, women and song to excess. And the pain of gout uh, was said to be as bad as um, a devil here, uh, um, sticking a hot poker into someone's um, foot. And this is a, a diagram of uh, a general uh, um, so uh, riddled with gout that he was unable to mount his horse. He had to be uh, mount put, uh, uh, lifted on a chair on to get onto his horse. Um, so it was uh, traditionally uh, an illness associated with excess, with good food, with wine, um, everything to excess. Uh, so the, the typical story of a patient that comes to see me with gout attacks um, would be one like this, uh, where someone has had celebration, they've had either beer or steamboat or kwecha or something nice and then uh, was initially okay, then after that went to bed that night woke up with incredible pain over the big toe joint. The big toe being very red, very hot, very swollen, cannot walk. Uh, went to the GP, the GP said, oh look, this is gout, gave medicines and then took medicines two to three days uh, later, everything was okay again. And the typical site in which it affects is usually the big toe joints. 
Um, sometimes it may affect the ankle or the knee, but it tends to be the lower limb. And initially, the pattern is rare. So you would get it once in a long, long time, and then a few years will pass, and then you get another attack, again, another celebration, and then another attack. And then um, as time passes over the next 10, 15 years, the attack frequency may go from being once every five years, maybe to once every year. And then after that, more and more frequently, once every six months, then once every month, then, oh, look, it's happening to me every week. And that's usually the time that uh, they come to my attention. So this is what a joint could look like if they, uh, the patient had gout. So if you look at this big toe here, this big toe joint here, the bunion here, it doesn't take a doctor to tell you that this is inflamed, it's red, it's painful, the patient is unlikely to be able to walk on it. And uh, very few people will sit on this and say, oh, look, my foot is swollen and not, not seek help. Yeah, it would be so very painful. It has been known to make grown men cry. Uh, and um, most people will go and see their doctor about this because they will be worried about whether it, that it's infected, for example. And sometimes it can be very difficult to tell between gout and an infection. Um, so most people will go and seek medical um, attention. And so when the joint is uh, very, very swollen and inflamed like this, um, uh, the patient themselves doesn't feel very well. They may have a little bit of fever. They may not be able to walk uh, and they may not be able to get comfortable. It may be so uncomfortable that they cannot even put uh, um, bed sheets or blankets over the affected area. So what is the relationship between gout and uric acid? So, you know, when you say, oh, uh, do you understand what gout is? Most people will just, uh, most of my patients will say to me, oh, it's uric acid. Yeah, really? What is uric acid? Well, in Malay, uric acid is called asam orat. In Mandarin, it's called niao suan. Neither of those tell you what it is. So in fact, uric acid is a waste product. It's rubbish. It is a waste product from your body that is made when a substance called purine is broken down in the body. So purine breakdown gives you uric acid. So where does this, where, where does this uric acid come from? Well, uh, it may surprise you to learn that in fact, only one third of the uric acid uh, uh, come from purines in our diet. Two thirds of it is actually produced naturally by the body. So even if you didn't eat anything at all, your body is still producing uric acid every day because of cell turnover. What cell turnover means is as a cell dies and a new cell is born, that process of dying and a new cell being uh, created um, causes uric acid to be formed, okay? So even if you ate nothing, you only drank water, you would still produce, uh, uh, you would still be producing uric acid. So uric acid, as I said earlier on, is a waste product. And this waste product is got rid of by the kidneys. And as we get older, uh, the same as uh, all the other parts of our body, um, our kidneys also start to deteriorate with age. Uh, my hair is white, yeah, my, I, my, I've become wrinkly, uh, and my kidneys, as time has gone on, has become less and less efficient at getting rid of rubbish, less and less efficient at getting rid of waste product, including uric acid. So as you get older, your body will have more and more, uh, 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 is less and less efficient at getting rid of the rubbish. So the rubbish starts to build up. So the uric acid levels slowly start to rise as we get older. And this is a diagram that shows you uh, um, what happens to uh, um, people as they get older and the likelihood of them getting gout. So um, if you look here, it shows that in the yellow bar is men and the gray bar is women. Okay, so 
in men, you can have gout at any age, but the, 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 the chance of you getting gout, the number of um, men that are affected with gout increases with increasing age, like what I explained. In women, after the age of, uh, before the age of menopause, gout is very rare. The reason why gout is very rare amongst healthy women who are still having periods is because the female hormone uh, helps the body to get rid of uric acid. So when women do not have the female hormone after the menopause, the, the, the number of women that uh, the level of uric acid in the woman's body tends to rise as well, but though, though not as much as men's. Um, and women also get gout, but at a much lesser rate compared to men as they get older. So um, uric acid is a form of rubbish and it doesn't dissolve very well in the blood. Um, so as the levels start to rise in the body, this rubbish starts to deposit and it deposits everywhere, okay? But can tend to deposit at the edges of joints as tiny crystals. And these tiny crystals form lumps. Um, and anything that causes a sudden rise or a sudden fall in the level of blood uric acid will cause the crystals to become unstable. So for example, uh, if a man who has a tendency towards gout goes and has six beers, uh, um, beer is very high in purine and uh, consuming a large uh, quantity of beer is like con uh, consuming a large uh, purine load, which will then cause a very high level of uric acid suddenly to be uh, present in the blood. A sudden rise in the level of blood uric acid will cause these crystals to deposit um, at various places, notably the big toe. And those deposited crystals are not stable. When the deposited crystals are not stable and they start to vibrate, the body's immune cells that are patrolling uh, will recognize these vibrating crystals as the enemy. It sees it as a germ. And so it attacks it like how it would attack a germ. So if you have a look at this picture here, it shows uh, a white blood cell that has uh, engulfed, uh, encircled and engulfed a, a, a uric acid crystal. And it's trying to digest it, but it's unable to do so. Um, and it undergoes a process that medics call frustrated phagocytosis. So it cannot, it cannot really uh, digest this crystal. Uh, and so it then uh, um, sends out chemical signals to call all its friends to come and attack it. So it's, it, it sends a signal that says, this is an undigestible germ, please send reinforcements. And so that is what causes um, uh, the patient to go to bed that night feeling very, very well at first. And then over a very short period of time, suddenly all the troops are called in and uh, a full-on war is going uh, on um, at his big toe, causing pain, redness, swelling, and heat. So this is another analogy which I find very useful. Um, and it, I hope, will allow you to understand a bit about why uh, um, people can end up in the situation that they end up with, with gout. So in healthy people, if you imagine the body like a tank of water and um, uric acid is like the water in the tank and it is made every day by the, the tap. So the tap here is either turned on when you eat something or just from the cells uh, that are born and the cells that die, it's made every day. And uric acid is lost in the urine every day. So for most of us, the levels stay pretty constant because as this is being made, this one is being lost every day. Now, um, as we get older, remember I said earlier on that uh, everywhere in the body starts to deteriorate as we get older, including the kidneys. So that drain down here is a little bit like uh, the kidney, okay? So as we get older, the rate of drainage may be less efficient. So with time, 
the water level in the tank starts to build up. And it builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up until it gets to about here. So when the water level is so high that little bits of turning on of the tap can cause the water to overflow, that is when the gout attacks happen very, very frequently. Initially, when the gout patient is young in his 20s, the kidney is still pretty efficient. Uh, the uric acid level may be down here. Um, and, you know, he has to drink a lot of beer before uh, um, um, uh, the, the uric acid, before the water level rises high enough to cause a splash over the side. But when the water level has already risen until this level, because of inefficient drainage, as people have got older, then it doesn't take a lot of turning on of the tap to cause the water to splash out by the side. So an attack of gout is analogous to having the water spill over the side. Um, and that may happen I, uh, both because of a reduced rate of drainage as well as um, because of turning on of the tap. There are of course lots of factors that can affect uh, blood uric acid level. Uh, diet is a big one and that we will talk about. Genetics is also um, a, a major factor in this part of the world. So there are um, people who are, uh, come to see me, uh, 18 years old, whose fathers, grandfathers, uncles, all have gout from very young age. They are born with kidneys where the channel to transport uric acid is much, much less efficient than everybody else's. So everybody else's one can transport a hundred times more than theirs. So if you're, you have a channel that can only transport one lot versus somebody who is born with a channel that big that can trans, uh, uh, transport lots, then it means that you start off with a level of uric acid in the uh, tank that is higher than everybody else's already at the same age. So uh, the level will increase faster as you get older dehydration, so it makes your blood more concentrated, so to speak. Um, if you are, have other illnesses that affect the kidney, for example, if you have uncontrolled blood pressure, if you have uncontrolled diabetes, these illnesses damage your kidneys, and therefore it makes your kidney function less efficient, with, uh, and therefore you can't get rid of waste as effectively. There are also certain types of medicines that make it hard for your kidneys to get rid of uric acid. Certain types of blood pressure medicines can make it hard for your kidneys to get rid of uric acid. And therefore, you may have a higher level of blood uric acid if you were on those medicines. Uh, people who are heavier, who are fatter, have a higher cell turnover um, and uh, they have higher blood uric acid levels. So obesity itself is a risk factor for uh, um, higher uric acid and for, uh, for gout. So this is what happens uh, over a prolonged period of time as people's kidneys get older and less efficient. So in the beginning, you would have a very long period of time and then you would have a flare up of pain. And then you'll have another very long period of time and then another flare up of pain. But as time passes, um, the attacks may become more and more and more and more and more frequent. And you may even get a situation where before the first attack settles down, the second attack has already begun. And usually it is this sort of stage where people come to my attention. So what can we do to manage gout? If we go back to our uh, water in the tank strategy again, uh, I said to you earlier on that an attack of gout happens when water spills over the side. So the common sense approach, if you looked at this diagram, would be that, okay, I can't do anything about the kidney. Okay, because this is a, a function of aging, yeah, and a lot of other factors that I cannot control at the moment. But the, the common sense approach would be, 
When you have water spilling over the side, then what we should do is to mop up the water. And number two, we should try to lower the water level in the tank to prevent further spillage. So if you look at that said in a different way, you are supposed uh, what the doctor does to try and help you manage gout is to settle the pain from the painful swollen joint, which is mopping up the spilled water, and reducing the uric acid level so as to minimize the chance of further attacks or lowering water level in the tank. If you go back to this picture, you can see that if you only mop up the water and you do nothing to lower the water level to prevent further spillage, then you're going to be mopping and mopping and mopping and mopping and not getting to the root of the problem. What you should be doing if the water level is so high that you keep getting water spillage is actually to be doing something about turning off the tap so that you don't have to use so many tactics to keep on mopping water that is spilling over. So maybe we deal with the settling the painful swollen joint first. When you have a very painful, hot and swollen joint, things that you can do to help yourself are, first of all, minimize activity. Don't go and aggravate it any further. Don't go and make it worse by walking on it, okay? So rest, put a cold compress on it. Uh, you can wrap some uh, ice pack or um, something frozen inside a towel or a, a pillowcase and put it uh, on the painful area for about five minutes, 10 minutes. Um, use painkillers if you're able to use painkillers. Go and see a doctor. The doctor may give you medicines like anti-inflammatory medicines or steroids or a medicine called colchicine. Uh, these medicines that are given by the doctor would uh, be the decision to give any of these medicines would be determined by your own underlying health and any other underlying medical problems that you may have. So the thing that I want to hammer home again and again and again for all of you is that this settling the painful swollen joint does nothing to lower the water level in the tank. All that it does is it mops up the spilled over water. Okay, so how can we uh, lower the water level in the tank? What are the strategies that can uh, be used to prevent further attacks? Um, well, drinking water to keep hydrated especially when the weather is very hot like these days, um, to reduce the intake of sugar and sugar-sweetened drinks, to minimize alcohol, uh, to avoid food high in purines, to lose weight. And if all of the above methods have already been adhered to, and Pete, you come and tell me, doctor, I am not eating anything my life is an absolute misery and I am getting attacks of gout twice a week where I cannot function uh, or you know, even less frequently than that, then I would say that you ought to consider having some medicines to actually bring down the water level in the tank. So let's go into this bit in a little bit more detail first because this is the bit that uh, um, there's always a lot of interest when whenever um, people talk about uh, diet and um, attacks. So remember that only one third of the body's uric acid is from diet. So there are all kinds of food that have been classified into food that are uh, low in purine level uh, and um, those that are moderate and those that are high. Nowadays, we know that uh, it is not as simple as it looks. For example, um, there are um, uh, certain types of vegetables that are said to be uh, moderately high in purine, 
but in actual fact, um, consumption of those vegetables in large scale studies have actually not been shown to increase the incidence of gout when you look at um, populations. Um, so for example, um, this was a study done at NUS a few years ago um, that showed that uh, in fact, uh, gout sufferers, uh, it's okay for them to eat soya products and legumes like peas and beans because um, it hasn't actually been shown to uh, increase the risk of gouty attacks. The other really interesting thing is that various studies have been shown that for the same level of blood uric acid, uh, consumption of plant-based uh, uh, diets seem to uh, reduce the risk of acute gouty attacks compared to if somebody had a meat-heavy diet. So we know that it is not just about the actual level of uric acid. It's not always quite as simplistic as that. There have been suggestions that there are certain chemicals that may be present in plants uh, and plant products that may make uh, the body's ability to turn down that uh, tap um, and therefore reduce the level of uric acid in uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the water level in the tank. Um, there are food that has been shown to reduce the chance of gouty flares. Uh, so um, usually uh, uh, patients will come and say to me, I can't eat this, I can't eat that, I can't eat that, I can't eat that, you know, all I can't, all uh, that you seem to be telling me is things that I can't eat. Well, I say to them, there are lots of things that you can eat. Uh, you can drink uh, coffee uh, freely, dairy products. You can have a balanced uh, diet rich in vegetables of many different colors, um, but you cannot juice, okay? You should not juice. You should eat food together with the fiber, uh, fruit together with the fiber as well. Um, and you should drink plenty of uh, liquid you must minimize intake of sugar-sweetened drinks. The reasons for avoiding sugar, especially sugar-sweetened drinks, is that this can cause a sharp rise in the blood uric acid level and trigger flares of gout. Uh, many people say to me, uh, oh, why is this so? It is so because uh, sugar, when sugar is broken down in the body, uh, it causes the production of uric acid. So, um, now all the bubble tea shops are shut. Uh, um, most of us should be taking this time to uh, uh, wean ourselves off the um, um, sugar addiction. Um, but uh, for people who uh, need a little bit more convincing, um, I would put it to you that um, the recommended daily allowance for added sugar in our diet is only six teaspoons for women and nine teaspoons for men. Um, to give you an idea of what a teaspoon is, uh, is one teaspoon is equivalent to four grams of uh, granulated sugar. So um, one cup of uh, bubble tea uh, with, uh, well, normal sweetness with pearls, maybe uh, 55 grams of sugar. So, you know, you're, you're looking at 10 to 12 uh, spoons of sugar at least per cup. Um, and that's not all. Uh, all our uh, local favorites uh, are such that um, uh, Kopitiam coffee is 15 grams of sugar per cup and Milo Kosong uh, uh, is three uh, teaspoons of sugar. So it's um, knowing your daily sugar allowance will allow you to decide what you are going to spend. Uh, it's like having a, a currency. Um, and, and uh, um, an amount of money in your wallet, what are you going to spend it on that day? So um, many of us think that fruit juices are healthy. Actually, they are not. Uh, the, something like Minute Maid uh, um, that you can get in uh, um, those fast food joints, actually very, very, very rich in sugar. And vitamin water uh, is nothing more than uh, water with vitamin C added as an antioxidant and coloring. Uh, and lots of sugar, um, there's absolutely no good um, 
for you whatsoever. Uh, uh, needless to say, Coca-Cola, uh, one small can, uh, nine spoons of sugar. Uh, shouldn't be drinking Coca-Cola anyway. Um, have you seen what it does to toilets and um, metal? Better don't. So um, facts for three-in-one fans. Um, I Hands up first, I used to be a three-in-one fan until I uh, was researching this talk some years ago. And I after I saw uh, the amount of content of sugar per packet, uh, I could not bring myself to drink it um, again. So, um, you know, the, the something like milk tea or milk coffee, 30 grams divided by four, you're looking at about seven, six to seven spoons. Okay. So, in fact, uh, this is a slight aside, but when taking excess sugar, gout flares are the least of your problems. Uh, there are a lot of other um, um, issues like uh, fatty liver that are a result of consuming sugar to excess. Uh, you may not look fat on the outside, but you may have uh, fat storage inside uh, problems uh, inside the liver, which uh, will then increase your risk uh, subsequently of liver cancer. So um, alcohol, uh, beer is uh, the worst culprit for um, um, causing rise in uric acid uh, uh, level as it is rich in purines. Other alcohol also increases the level of uric acid um, and worsens the kidney's ability to get rid of uh, uh, uric acid. So um, this brings us neatly into the subject of uh, medications um, and medications to lower uric acid. So who should have medicines? Well, you should have medicines to lower uric acid levels or lower the water level in the tank if you're getting more than three attacks of gout a year, if you already have impaired kidney function, if you already have kidney stones, or if you have lumps of uric acid under the skin and around joints, you should be, so if you have one or more of these categories, you should be having medicines to lower the uric acid level in your blood. And there are two broad categories of medicines that you could have. So um, your, med your doctor uh, will be able to advise on the correct type of medicine for you. And some people may need both types together if the gout is severe enough. These medicines to prevent the attacks act by lowering the level of uric acid in the body and usually have to be taken for life including during attacks. So uh, I told you earlier on that there are two types of medicines. Okay, so this is back to that same picture again about mopping up the water and lowering the water level. So the first kind turns off the tap. The second kind increases uric acid excretion. This kind is not very efficient and is limited in who it can be used on. So for example, if you already have kidney function that is impaired, if you already have kidney stones, you cannot have this kind of medicine. Most people, by the time they seek uh, medical attention, already cannot have this kind because uh, um, their kidney function tends to be impaired already um, partly by other illnesses, partly by the gout that's not treated itself. Um, so the rubbish from the uric acid uh, that can clog up the kidneys and affect kidney function as well. So um, the majority of people that are offered medicines to lower uric acid um, have this kind, the kind that uh, reduce production of uric acid. And there are two possible uh, uh, ones on the market now here in Singapore, um, xyloric or allopurinol and febaxostat or adenuric. Okay, These two I'm not going to talk about because these are the ones that are not common and not commonly used, not commonly prescribed. So when starting on uh, uric acid lowering medicines, medicines to bring down the level of uric acid, doctors usually started 
start low and go slow. So most doctors will start you on half a tablet to one tablet uh, and increase it every two to four weeks, depending on your blood uric acid level. And the target uh, uric acid level that uh, they're aiming for is 300 to 350 micromoles per liter or five to six milligram per deciliter of uric acid. Why are they aiming for this? They are aiming for this because this level in the blood allows all the deposits of rubbish inside your body to slowly dissolve and no new deposits to form. So when you are started on the medicine, you would be started on a very low dose and then the dosage is gradually increased with time. And in the beginning, of starting the medicines in the first six months to a year, initially the gout will seem to get worse. What this means is that when you first start taking medicines to get rid of all of these uric acid crystals, you will end up having more attacks in the beginning. Um, the only way I can explain uh, it uh, um, is um, uh, I use this concept of uh, pai du to my patients, meaning that as your body is, uh, um, as the, the dosage of medicine is gradually being increased, um, what happens with all these uh, deposits is that as you are taking it, the, the deposits start to dissolve and they start to destabilize. When they start to destabilize, you will have paradoxically more attacks. It doesn't mean that the medicine is not working. In fact, it means the medicine is working, okay? So the beginning hurdle is the one that many people fall down at, especially if they didn't understand the need to uh, continue taking the medicine or if uh, they weren't given a proper explanation on what to expect. So if I started you on a medicine, I say, hey, you know, this medicine is to prevent you from getting gouty attacks, but I didn't tell you that when you first start taking it, you're gonna get worse then when you do get worse, you're thinking, huh, this doctor tells me that I should be, uh, you know, like uh, taking a medicine to reduce my uh, uh, number of uric acid uh, 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 gouty attacks. And then uh, in fact, I'm worse. Che, don't want to take already. Lah. Yeah, so that leads to many people stopping the medicines because they believe it's not working. So your doctor, in order to reduce the chance of these flare ups, the doctor will often recommend that you take a small dose of the medicine that is used to treat a flare-up. So a small dose of a, a medicine to mop up the water, uh, even if you don't have any pain, to actually prevent the flare-ups from happening. Uh, and um, we do this in the initial six months and then wean off the flare medicine later. So, the other things to say about medicine to lower uric acid are that they don't work on their own without the lifestyle modifications. It is also not 100% foolproof. If you drop, if you manage to turn off the tap such that the water level has dropped significantly in the tank, but then you go and have your 12 beers again, then um, you may turn on the tap enough to have it uh, uh, flow over. Um, but often, much less frequently than before. So uh, the other thing about this um, medicine to lower the uh, level of water in the tank is that it will not work if you only take it when you have an attack. Um, I also encourage people not to stop it when you are having an attack of gout because the fluctuation of the uric acid level will worsen the attack. So um, I must caution... Uh, um, you all about um, the commonest medicine that we use to lower uric acid level, which is called allopurinol. 1% uh, of Han Chinese people, of which we are, uh, carry a gene that makes it likely for us to develop an allergic reaction towards allopurinol. So there is a blood test that is available to see whether you have this gene. It's about $130. Uh, but the um, as with everything in life, it's just too easy if you can just check and then uh, say, oh, you can take it or cannot. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's uh, if you have the gene, then we wouldn't start you on allopurinol. But if you don't have the gene, you may still develop allergy. 
through other genes. Okay, so life is never so straightforward. So the 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 main uh, um, thing to say to all of you whenever you are due to start or whenever you are starting any new medicine, not just gout medicines, but any new medicine at all, is that if you are taking a new medicine and you develop mouth ulcers, swelling of your eyes, or rashes everywhere, or severe diarrhea, or severe vomiting, then uh, it's likely that the medicine is not agreeing with you and that you should stop it and seek medical advice. So, Starting uh, uric acid lowering medicines uh, and with any medicine at all, your doctor will tell you to look out for allergic reactions. So people usually uh, um, at this point say, well, you know what? If I watch what I eat, I can be free of attacks. Yes, up to a point only. Okay, so if you are at this stage, where the water level in the tank is still quite low, sure, you can control it very, very well by just being mindful with what you eat, eating healthily, uh, dramatically changing your lifestyle, losing weight. Yes, you can. But when you are getting, so when the water level is down here, and let's say you were a heavy drinker before, uh, and it was the heavy drinking that caused the tap to be turned on. Yes, if you control the amount of alcohol, you are turning off this tap and uh, the water, the, the uric acid level will fall. But if it is because your kidney function is already not good and the water level started off being up here, and that even if you didn't eat and have any dietary indiscretion, just ate what you could to live, you might still find that you have um, um, periods of time where you get attacks. So um, the second myth is that uh, many people will say, oh, well, you know what? I'm already on so many medicines and I should just put up with the pain. I don't want to take more medicines. Uh, and anyway, it's just painful joints. You know, it's not a big deal. It's just painful joints. Um, just tahan the pain. Lah. Well, in fact, life as we, uh, um, I'm sure a lot of us have had lots of thinking time with the coronavirus and realize that actually life is about balance. And um, take water, for example. If you have too little water, too little water is incompatible with life. Too much water is also incompatible with life. Okay. But when you have a nice balance, yeah, life can be a truly, truly wonderful and truly, truly wonderful place here. So the same is true with everything. Uric acid is not an exception. Okay? Human beings have evolved to have high uric acid in order to allow us to maintain our blood pressure when we went from being all fours to upright. So as a, uh, um, but if you don't control your uric acid level, uh, as the level of uric acid rises, uric acid waste uh, deposits as crystals everywhere in the body and the attacks will become more frequent and then you will start seeing lumps that accumulate and it accumulates everywhere in the skin, in the joints, in the tendon, in the kidneys, in the blood vessels, in your heart, in your spine, um, and if so, if you have a look at um, these digits here, this is um, a condition called tophaceous gout, where the uric acid uh, crystals have built up so much that um, they are like this white chalky material that sits um, around the joints. So if you have a look at this, this is someone's hand and this is an x-ray, and I want you to, to draw your attention to this bone over here, okay? So you have, look, a normal bone looks like this, okay? And all this white stuff here is the uric acid. And can you see what the uric acid has done? It's just basically eroded more tap the bone, causing the bone to be eroded and eaten away. 
such that it looks like as though a rat has taken bites out of this person's bone. So even if by the time it's got to this kind of situation, if I give the patient a medicine and that this dissolves away completely, that bone will always be scarred. It will never be like this bone ever again. Okay, so um, this is one extreme of what will happen if we don't do anything to uh, um, uh, treat the condition. So you imagine this sort of stuff is depositing everywhere. This is only the surface what you can see. So these, these uh, lumps are called tophi and they can be everywhere. They ulcerate through the skin. So this, this guy's got it in his ear here. This one here, it, the lump has got so big, it has caused the skin to break down. The skin is just disintegrating because um, this, this uh, crystal is pushing through. And when you imagine that you've got a giant pile of rubbish here, and you've got an area of broken skin on your foot and you're walking around, what will happen is that the germs from the environment and the floor will go in, okay? And it's not easy for your own body's uh, white cells or um, germ-fighting cells to get in and amid the pile of rubbish. It's a little bit like saying, oh, okay, now we ha have uh, a huge pile of rubbish. Okay, let's imagine that we've got bad guys in Samakau Island and it's just just giant landfill, okay? And uh, now you have, uh, you're wanting to ask your troops to wade through rubbish to go and fight the germs. It's not so easy, okay? So I have seen people end up with having parts of their foot taken off because um, these lumps of uric acid uh, uh, harbored bacteria within that later on put the health of the owner of the, 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 the foot at risk. So don't do it. Um, other areas that can be affected by very high uric acid. Uh, so the uric acid, um, I told you, it cannot be dissolved very well. So it deposits in other places as well. So it can cause kidney stones like this. And then it just basically clogs all the little drains inside the kidney and it affects kidney function. Um, we also know that, uh, you know, how uh, um, uh, people used to say that, oh, there are sun cow, three high things, the uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol and high sugar. Uh, well, now the fourth one is high uric acid. So we now know that high uric acid increases the risk for heart attacks and strokes. And the impact of having very high uric acid on a heart attack and stroke risk is, as, is the same as uh, high blood pressure, diabetes and smoking. So if you do not do anything to treat very, very high uric acid, uh, you will have an 800 um, times um, higher risk of kidney failure. Uh, 350 higher, uh, times higher risk of liver disease, uh, 200, um, 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 two times, sorry, not, not 800 times, 800 percent, uh, 358 percent, uh, 233 percent um, uh, of risk of stroke and heart disease. So, you know, it is not, um, um, so my take home message to all of you is that actually gout is, yes, it is a lifestyle disease, but there's a very strong genetic component. If you have already had your first attack, look towards modifying your lifestyle. Look towards modifying your lifestyle to delay the need for medications. If you've already had more than three attacks in 12 months, you should strongly consider having medicines to lower the level of blood uric acid because failure to control blood uric acid level in the um, may have a major long-term detrimental effect on your health, just the same as high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and diabetes can. Okay, so um, this just is a summary slide that shows you that quite aside from just having this bit, which is the arthritis and pain that many people are aware of with gout, in actual fact, the elephant in the room, what people don't see is far, far more worrying 
than what they do see. So when we see just this, when your doctor sees your, when you go to your doctor with gout because you're having arthritis and pain, and I start worrying on and asking you about when you last had your sugar checked or whether you monitor your, your blood pressure at home, I am seeing these other things that are going to kill you. This may or may not. These almost certainly will. Okay? So um, it's time to uh, look at gout in, and give it the respect that it deserves. Uh, it is not just niao suan. Okay? It's not just pain. It's not just uh, uh, a little bit of pain that I should be able to bear. It's much, much more than that. It is a warning for us to uh, look towards uh, modifying other risk factors which can truly have a very big impact on our subsequent quality of life. Um, so for more information, there's lots and lots of places that you can go and have a little look at. Uh, what's the time now? Okay, so I think uh, I might be able to take a couple of questions. I understand that there is another Brown Centre talk coming up soon. Yes, uh, Doctor, would you like to stop share? Yes, um, that was a very good uh, presentation. Um, I have colleagues who are young uh, in the past and they already have gout, you know, and uh, some of the things that you have shared are actually really new to me. And thank you for highlighting um, sugar because during our lunch talk, lunch webinar, Dr. Naras um, and uh, Brahm Center colleagues actually have done quite a few sessions on sugar. Ah. And, I, and I think people still you know, need to hear it a couple of times because uh, our body likes sugar and it's very, it's very- It's drug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a legal drug. Yeah, so we have it to kind of- It's your brain. <laughs> Yes, and uh, we need to you know, say it a couple of times before people really realize that um, if we don't manage that, uh, it can actually cause various things uh, to our body. Yeah, yes. for the same reason why you see all those people queuing for bubble tea on the night that uh, um, the, you know, the, the, the uh, circuit breaker, breaker went, went through is because your brain treats the sugar in exactly the same way as it does any other addictive drug. Yes. Hmm. Yes. Um, and we, your, your, presentation, your presentation shared a lot of information. So a lot of uh, questions got answered. But we have a couple that uh, I would like to um, voice it out to you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have this lady who is about 35 years old. And she had uh, ankle pain for a month. Mm -hmm. And um, she has seen the doctor and the doctor has diagnosed it as gout. But when she does the blood test, her uric level in the blood test is okay. So is there something else she can do? Mm. So if it persists and she's 35 years old and the uric acid level is normal uh, and it has not got better, then I would ask her to make sure that she goes back to the doctor and asks for a referral to see somebody um, for further investigations. Because okay. there, are, there are ways of diagnosing to see whether uh, some people can have a normal uh, blood uric acid level, even with gout, but there are ways that we can tell. There are other tests that can be done that go beyond just uh, blood tests. Yes. And how about uh, alcohol, like wine and whiskey? If hmm. people are drinking like two, uh, two glasses a day. Ah, so so uh, I didn't have time to talk about. Uh, um, I didn't have time to talk about um, uh, recommended daily amounts of uh, alcohol. Um, but uh, the um, the. There are, there, are, there are various camps of doctors, okay, uh, who feel, there are some doctors who feel that there is no safe limit for alcohol. 
um, um, yeah, mm. because of the risk of um, causing hypertension, as well as the, um, there is also um, evidence to suggest that uh, uh, long-term alcohol consumption, even within limits, may uh, increase your risk of other conditions like cancer. So there are, there are a group of doctors that feel that there is no such thing as a safe limit. But uh, not all alcohol is uh, where, where the issue of gout is concerned. Um, not all alcohol is equal. So if you had to, if you are somebody with known gout and you had to have a drink because it was a celebration, then I would say stay away from beer. Uh, uh, try and go for red wine if you had to choose something. Yeah, half a glass of red wine um, um, is probably your best bet uh, um, in the order of um, least, least likely, uh, least recommended would be beer. Second least recommended would be uh, hard liquor. And then um, I would go for the red wine. <laughs> yeah, but, but um, so not all alcohol is equal. Yes, I think the importance is really more, uh, moderation, right? Yes, Take, yes. Uh, so it's exactly like what I shared earlier on about um, the water. So if you if you ever sort of um, stop to, uh, um, whenever you have to, const I, I, I go back myself, I go back to that analogy of water again and again and again, even in my own life, uh, because water is something very easy for us all to understand. And drought and flood is something that is very easy for us to understand as well. You just have to remember that uh, in, uh, in the world, uh, that there is nothing that is absolute. Yeah, even coronavirus is not absolute. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, 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 you know, so there is, uh, uh, it's always about balance. So it's finding that balance uh, that is right for you um, and finding the balance that is right to maintain uh, the, uh, um, the body in a state of health. Uh, because the body, as we get older, is like vintage car. Yes, so vintage car needs much more attention <laughs> compared to, uh, you know, uh, a brand new car, for example. Yeah, so, so um, the, you have to take care of the vintage I think car. The challenge, I think the challenge is that for vintage car, at least you place a part for human body is very very ah, difficult yala. so that's why we have to make sure that we use really good quality engine oil and all the other sort <laughs> of tinkering that my father has a vintage car so he seems to be tinkering with the car all the time uh this and that and that and that and that so um um you know and and special polishers and whatnot so th the, the same is true of the human body to maintain it because recovery is the aspect that is affected in all of us as we get older. That's why we degenerate mm. because we cannot recover as fast. Yeah. Mm. So Thank we you. Just, Thank you so much. What we have. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful talk and uh, we want to see you back here again. Okay. I, I just asked Angie to invite me again. <laughs> yeah, we it's back. been a pleasure, okay. everyone. Um, this, is, this is like the first time I've uh, talked um, on Zoom to more than my five students. So it's quite an experience for me too. I yes. hope you found it. 76 attendees, yes. Okay. Enjoy the next talk. I'm sure that will be equally informative. Okay. You have a good day. You too. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Please take care of yourselves.